Link will be helping facilitate the meeting. Ashley, will you please take a moment and provide instructions to the commission and members of the public on how the meeting will proceed? Thank you, Chair. For members of the public who are attending this meeting virtually and wish to provide comment, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. For those who are attending um, or calling in from the landline or cell phone, please press star nine to raise your virtual hand. Members of the public attending uh, in person may fill out a comment card and provide it to a staff member. Um, public comment is limited to three minutes in length. So if there's a large number of public comments, commenters, the chair can adjust the length of time that you can comment. And with that, I'll return the meeting to the chair. Thank you, Ashley. Um, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. Please clearly state your name and address or political jurisdiction in which you live. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda. Therefore, the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Ashley, do we have any public comment? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on any item not on the agenda, Please notify the staff liaison by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. That looks like we have a comment. Thank you. Okay. We begin tonight with a presentation by the Ravenswood City School District uh, on their Bellhaven School Field Redesign Project. Will Iger from the district is here to make the presentation make the presentation. Good evening, commissioners, and thank you so much for having us. Uh, we were able to join this commission. Uh, we met in the Bellhaven Library, gosh, I don't know, four months ago or so. Um, and since then, we've been working on continuing to flesh out our design for Bellhaven Elementary. This is part of a $50 million overhaul of the school. Um, so we are touching pretty much every space on that. Uh, campus. We're building three new buildings and modernizing every classroom. Modernizing, I think, is a word probably understates what we're doing. Really taking every classroom down to the studs and reconstructing it. Floors and ceilings and walls, storage space, furniture, everything will be done. Um, as part of that, we're moving the school into temporary classrooms, as we'll, we'll talk about. Um, but what we want to talk about tonight is really the, uh, was it, north, northwest part of the campus. And we'll, we'll talk through it. And the superintendent scenario here will talk to some of the options. Yes, if you don't mind, on the next slide. So, as um, Will Eager mentioned, um, we are exploring what to do on the northwest side of the campus. Um, but first, you know, regardless of how we do utilize that space, we want to emphasize that. Um, the renovation of that entire campus, we wanted to make sure there is community access to the brand new gym. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that there's plenty of parking and increase the canopy and the green space on that campus. And we also want to make sure that there is access to the artificial turf, um, as well as um, making sure that the space behind the school has a renovated blacktop. And then Will mentioned also the entire campus, the buildings will be touched and renovated, each and every single classroom. Great. So, what to do with that northwest corner? Um, what best to understand how to utilize that space um, is getting information from the community. We were able to narrow it down to three options. And so the first option there you see is including a community picnic grove with full-sized parking spaces. Let's see that one back inside there. In the middle for option two was maintaining the current tennis courts that are there with partial parking. And then option three is to consider a community health clinic with mid-sized parking. So we want to make sure we 
did extensive engagement with the community and exhaust as much as possible ways to get feedback about how to best utilize this space um, and hear from not just our own school community members, but residents and other folks in the area. So we made sure that we created a website um, that included an online poll in English and in Spanish. We made sure that an, an, a mailer that explained clearly what's going to be happening on this campus also included these options. And there was a survey link with a QR code also that took them directly to be able to give feedback. Um, we have a district website, Facebook, Instagram, um, and we made sure that was also publicized on a regular basis. And then Will Eager and our community outreach, family and community engagement coordinator did extensive um, outreach in front of local markets, in front of the Boys and Girls Club, in front of the Bell Haven School, um, to ensure that, that there was that face-to-face -face communication and that we could get feedback from folks that we typically do not hear through surveys and websites. Mm -hmm. um, and we collected there over 100 responses. And you can see some artifacts in the, in the illustrations. And so the results show that the health clinic is favored. And so out of the 123 respondents, 51% um, of the community who participated and who were able to reach favored the health clinic. Uh, our CBO will can share a little bit more about the next steps and maybe even some narratives about um, the results, right? And I'm sure maybe the commission may want to hear that and why maybe the health clinic was top choice. In our next slide, we'll discuss the next steps. <clears throat> so it's it's one thing to say, let's put a health clinic here. It's another thing to actually figure out how to build it, right? So once we started seeing some of the results come in, we, we kept the survey live just in case folks who are watching now, there's a, a big groundswell of, oh no, now that we see this, we're really going to be something else. But we are trying to have a, a reasonably open dialogue about this, but we put out a request for proposals to see if anybody would actually be interested in, in putting a health clinic there. As many of you may know, the Ravens of Family Health Clinic, which has long been in this community uh, and was previously, I believe, uh, in the Odetta Harris Center, uh, will not be in the new iteration of that space. Uh, and so it has been looking for a local space. I do have a new space in Palo Alto, but don't have something walking distance in Menlo Park, or excuse me, in Belhaven. And when I think various folks for sort of gained understanding of that, we, we actually saw people switch their votes. Like, oh, we really need parking here because there's going to be a field for youth games. We need to make sure we have more than just street parking. Oh, wait, that health clinic's not going back in the Atlanta Harris Center. Maybe we do need a health clinic here, something local. And we heard from a lot of parents in particular, you know, as the parent uh, who had to go to a doctor visit yesterday, it's a big chunk of your day that gets, you know, sucked out getting to the doctor, <laughs> dropping the kid off back at school or daycare. Having a health clinic next to a school makes that pretty seamless for, for parents and families. So it doesn't just locate it centrally, but it does locate it um, on, school set, on school property. We're pleased to report that as a result of that request for proposals at RFP, the Ravens with Family Health Clinic uh, did provide a strong response. And the board did authorize us to proceed with uh, Ravens with Family Health Clinic to see if we could reach an agreement. So we, at this point, do not have an agreement. We have not figured all the details out. There are many, many details to resolve. But we are seriously uh, exploring that. One that we believe has significant community support. I am aware that this is the Parks and Recreation Commission, which is probably most excited about the park, and not necessarily the, the Health Clinic uh, Commission, um, if such commission exists. I would highlight that this is really going to be what we believe is a, a premier outdoor space in the area. So we're talking about you know, dozens of, of trees, a new garden area that's going to actually maintain that picnic area element. Uh, you can almost see it with multiple site entrances, one from the west, just south of the all five uh, classrooms there. Um, you can see it a little bit in the, the pathway, but that sort of center bioswale, that bluish uh, green center strip is going to have a couple of platforms with little landing areas around it. So you can actually have little kids who go up on the rail and look down, see what's happening in the bioswale and kind of get a little glimpse of, of some local nature here. Um, so we're going to find the designs of this course. And right now I was showing, uh, I was drawing a, a video of what that field looks like right now. It does not look very nice right now. Right now it is getting ready to be temporary classrooms. And that's what we're working on now. We're going to move the whole school out onto that field. Um, 
that's going to take about 18 months of construction. So it'll start in December, but basically two years of that field being closed. Um, once we're able to move students uh, out of those classrooms into the new, new classrooms, we'll work on this field. So the field will be kind of the last thing to get uh, fixed up on this site. We're hoping uh, that we'll do it summer of 2024. I imagine that's when we'll start and they go a little bit longer. We're still working on that part of the construction schedule. And we're still working on the final, final designs of this space. So unlike the classrooms, which, you know, we know where we light bulbs screw and panels going, we're still working on detail in this field. Uh, but this is this is the direction that we're sort of seriously exploring at this point, knowing that we're obviously still working for more feedback, both from the public and this commission, as well as uh, the city. And we're also trying to understand if we um, will be able to reach an agreement with the Ravens of County Health. But I'm certainly not a given. Any kind of, of crown lease negotiation is complicated and special in some way. Um, but with that, I think that, that more or less concludes our presentation. We're happy to, to take questions from the commission and if y'all have any. Well, um, thank you. So I mean, I think it's an amazingly creative use of the space. And, and obviously, I think it's it's awesome that you did so much outreach and, and thinking about the all of the needs of the um, of the community. I guess I'm trying to think as, as a parent of elementary school kids, um, just trying to think through the potential dangers or issues with having a health clinic on site with young kids, um, and also thinking about the logistics of having a very busy health clinic during the, during the day. I think obviously the advantage typically when you have um, sporting, when you have like a lot of tennis courts and other things is that you, the traffic is offset. You know, you sort of tend to have those when school hours aren't there. So I'm sure you've thought about all these things, but I'm just curious how you have how you have reconciled these kind of what seems to be two pretty significant concerns. I would say we, I wouldn't say we necessarily solved any of these issues yet, but we've started the process of that. So the Ravenswood Family Health Clinic provides a lot of in-school services, whether it's dental, vision, um, or other services.
just the financial viability and just understanding that. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar. I assume this is a nonprofit. And so I think obviously there's just some risk of making sure that it's it's viable and continues to be viable, um, especially because there's not just the initial outlay, but the ongoing costs. Yes, I think that's that's something that I think we're working on in the contract of how do we ensure uh, both you know completion guarantees and uh, if we are your marketing space for you, how do we make sure that you actually are going to follow through on the promise of this space? And then also thinking just about we do think as part of this, we have asked for financial statements for the, the clinic, and they are at this point in time reasonably financially healthy. I, I think it is hard to speculate longer term what that looks like. They are not. Really, I don't read this. He's like, a yeah. book for next. So I do think that is a risk that even more we have to play, our will have to play and range of partnership. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry to interrupt again, <laughs> but apparently we we lost um, the owl for a moment there and it came back. And when it came back, it was muted. So we actually haven't had live audio for a few minutes. And uh, we were just made aware by that by one of our participants who, who texted and emailed it and told us. So if you could call, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Vice Chair Boston, if you could call for public comment again, oh, there, sure. there might be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but Thank you, um, community member who made us aware for that. Okay, so um, Ashley, do we have any public comment? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please notify the staff liaison by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. Number two, have a comment. Pam Jones. Good evening. Good evening. Pam Jones here. Um, and I hope you can hear me. We can. Yes. Yeah. Okay, super. And I'm so glad I can hear you now because it was well over 10 minutes. So all the discussion you were having about the clinic, that was when um uh when the volume dropped off, I was unable to hear. Uh, but I, what I do want to say is I uh, I applaud the district for um, uh, for their plans and uh, particularly for uh, having a clinic, the possibility of, of having a clinic. We saw during COVID what we need in this community is some place that we have that's close that we have services. Um, Going to uh, the Ravenswood Center in East Palo Alto at times does not work. Um, so keep that in mind. And I think as far as the safety of the children, that given this is this is um, an educational system, that they will, in fact, work that out. Um, I do want you to know that uh, uh, my daughters were K through eight at that school and it had not changed. So what they're doing now is wonderful because it's more than a facelift. Uh, it is something that I th think we're going to be proud of in the community and hopefully will draw people to back so that their children, uh, the children in the community more will be attending the Ravenswood City School District. So again, I thank you um, uh, for the work that, that you're doing as Superintendent Gina and, uh, and I also thank the uh, diligence of the um, commission here. Thank you. Thank you. If anyone else would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen. Oops, there's one more public comment. Okay, open for Parks and Recreation Commission discussion again. <laughs> 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 um, just picking up from where we left off, um, I appreciate that uh, you went a bit um, of an extra mile to um, to get the community feedback in the ways that you did with the face-to-face -face interaction in the community. I think that's really important. Yeah, I'll just echo that thought as well. I think. Um, I recall when we did some community outreach for um, spending for the Neilan Park re renovation, we had some excess funds and we gave the, the community an opportunity to come in person, um, did a similar sort of whiteboard, you know, vote. And 
I really do think the people that come out and and vote they're, they're strong, they're supporters. Um, they probably speak for some other people in the community that didn't have a chance to make it out. Um, so I think you know as much as we as a Parks and Recreation Commission love to see the tennis courts or more open space or less driving, uh, you know, less parking. The idea that this is what the community wants and needs, hearing it from the members, uh, makes me feel better about the direction that you're going. So thank you. We will be installing a lot of bike racks and <laughs> and EV chargers. I think we do want this to be a very walkable space. America makes a very walkable campus. So I, I while we are adding some parking, I, I reassure the commission that the goal is very much a walkable, livable. Uh, I had a question about just access to the field. Is, is it going to be um, dawn to dusk kind of thing? We we have an existing agreement with the city of Menlo Park for use of that field and maintenance of that field. Um, I believe our policy is to not allow dogs. Um, oh, I don't know how strictly that policy has been upheld in the past, but our, our intent is more for this more to be more of a youth athletic field, not necessarily a dog field. Um, oh, it's an hourly operation. Dogs dogs dogs. Dogs. I think it's a dog's at dusk. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> like, we're not going to be able to get dogs. Dogs at dusk is probably not the vibe we're going for. Uh, sorry. I'm just saying. Uh, the, 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 no, the site would not be dogs at dusk. Um, this is a school site, and it is intended to be a school site. This field is intended to be part of the school, uh, perhaps used by all five from time to time, but, but part of the school during the school day. And so what we've we're really trying to reduce our, what I believe is an over-reliance on fencing. And so what we've tried to do is actually place buildings uh, in, a, in a way that creates a natural barrier without it feeling like owner of fencing. And so you'll notice that there actually are, are fairly controlled points of entry to the field, namely there are two. One is a gate that is a current gate actually by all five that I think we would keep closed most of the time, but we have there as a potential pedestrian gate. The other would be uh, the, I've already screwed up my so right, so southwest. Yeah, thank you. The southwest corner where that little gray area is, right? Exactly. There would be another pedestrian gate there. Um, we would imagine that both of those gates would remain closed during the school day, but the space would be available weekends, summer, spring break, after hours when school is not in session. Um, so we do want this to be open, but not necessarily open from you know eight to nine. Okay, so no like evening soccer games with lights or we're not planning on putting lights in on this field. We know that lights are, are complex and controversial. So at this point, we are not planning on putting lights in on this space. And there is a, a lighted athletic field not far from there on Kennedy Park. Yeah. And, and, and the Bridge Bay on the other the other side too. Yeah. Okay. I would add the the dimensions of this field because of the sort of uniqueness of the space. This is also not a premium adult field. This is a K-5 screen. We are envisioning this as a sort of a premium six grade field. So it's a little bit smaller. It's meant more for youth sports and youth soccer. Okay. Like it's traditionally don't play at those hours. This is not regulation science soccer. It's regulation like U-12 kind of thing. So it's 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 not regulation adult soccer. And there is a little bit of a walking loop around there too, which is meant for kind of that's what you're and that's like that right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are little bleachers you can see just to the south of the field by the entrance there. Uh, under the under the trees is a little hard to see under the canopy, but there, yeah, exactly. Just uh, so our, again meant for meant for sitting and watching these soccer, not uh high school games. You mentioned that there's an area in here with a um, a platform overlooking uh um, yes. Um you can see there's there's a, there's actually many of them. Uh, I think the easiest ones to see right there, yes. Um, there's, there's four up there and they're above the bios well. So when it rains, the thought is that there's a little bit of a, a bridge between the field and the school. Again, to have controlled points of entry to the school, but then to have little platforms, uh, any sort of public access side where you can look over to the bios well and kind of see what's happening there. We, we sort of envision this little box describing the, the nice club. Um, I absolutely love the idea of the plaques of driving the plants below. Um, I think some of the most beautiful parks I've seen around the world. I like the local flora, and um, I'm, I'm so happy to hear that you're thinking about that. We love 
I would say we love the idea. Yeah. That. I would say we love the idea so much that we actually extended it all along that side of the field. So uh, to the uh, east side, uh, you'll see the path going down, and then you'll see little curves out. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, right along uh, Blue's Chilco. So keep going the other way. Yeah, there you go. All along there, you'll notice the little cutouts. That's actually just continuing that little platform half walk. So for uh, nerdy kids like me, not athletic kids like Superintendent Staria, place to sit and look out at it for the you know, nice calm tranquil place. But, and both uh, kids like us would be able to benefit more from the learning here because we're also um, moving forward towards Bellingham Elementary School being the STEAM school um, in our district. So it definitely build upon that instructional program. One other nerdy touch while we're just on this, you'll notice that the corner in the southeast of the school, it has what looks like almost graph paper with lines going across it. That's actually a replica of the tide charts in the bay. Mm -hmm. um, and so there'll be sort of seating and also continuation of uh, built in flat panels that sort of carry that out drug. So we are trying to kind of embrace uh, nature and science and sort of subtle, aesthetically pleasing ways that are also nice places to sit and hang out. But uh, we appreciate that. <laughs> you put a lot of thought in that particular aspect. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. So, in all my years of living on Hamilton Avenue, I've never seen the tennis court lose once. But I've used, I've seen the baseball field used by a local community group, I think. Is that, I don't see this, that as part of the plan. Where's the baseball field going? I would, uh, and I don't know if Ms. Jones is still on, but I think she would probably uh, recommend that I, I mention the deep roots of tennis in the community. So even though that tennis court to has not always been particularly accessible, I think they're deep caring tennis players in the community, which is why we're adding more tennis courts out of this. So we're, we're adding six tennis courts in the middle school. So we do believe there's there's a big role for tennis in our community. We're not trying to end in any way tennis in the area. We do not find a lot of support for that tennis court. In terms of that baseball field, I don't believe uh, that field was used recently, I believe this summer. That was a, a group that was basically looking for a temporary emergency field. And that was more or less their last choice of field. Um, one of the thinking that we have around a turf field is that it can be a multi-use space. So that field, um, if you hit the ball down the right field line, you're sort of smack to the side of the uh, tennis courts. So it's not really even meant for adult soccer, adult softball. It's really meant for, you know, Evolve and need to fish. Yeah, um, our thought is with the turf field, you can actually set up on a corner of that. You could actually set up and replicate a similar baseball experience. So our thought is potentially should we want to should the commissioner recommend so me recommend that adding in striping so you could actually play similar levels of T-ball on the turf field. Which is done at Lawn Trotis as well. So yeah. It's not part of the best baseball experience. It's kind of fast and field, but it's not. It's not the worst either. I think it's, it's no, kind of and I think it's comparable to offering as well. I think that I would love to emphasize is making sure that whatever recreational space is developed here, when we get the final design, that it's you clearly communicate how to access yeah. this field or other spaces outside um, the greater community. Um, because perhaps maybe folks didn't know necessarily how to access the tennis courts. I mean, we keep those gates locked. Um, and I think some community members mentioned that it was difficult to access because those gates were locked during the school day. And then, but how do we make sure people know how to best utilize and access that space in the city? And we need to do our part to communicate that clearly. We want our fields to be used. We want kids and families on our fields when we're not using them. If I may, there was just one other element of this that I don't know if there was too much discussion about it, but there's a proposed uh, like a gymnasium uh, yes. building. Maybe spend a minute just to inform the commission about the thoughts there. Sure, I'm not easy to follow the design just to describe it, but. Um, sure. Where there's that entrance sort of to the southern tip of that parking lot, there's a, that courtyard and an envision to do full size gymnasium. We're very conscious about putting it there um, with the goal of making that a clear entrance to the field. That is the current entrance to the field, but I think many members of the community would be surprised to know that that is where the designated entrance to the field was. And so our thought is by putting the gym there, putting the parking there, it's a clear entrance. 
It also potentially allows, and I think there's certain things to work out with around um, use, but bathroom access, a gym access for you know, kind of indoor outdoor birthday party. So we're, we're still working on some design aspects of that to make it feel more permeable. Um, but also just thinking about the, the goal is to have that gym be part of what Superintendent Starry was referring to around, you know, keeping the fields full, keeping the gym full too. And so putting it in a space that's not exactly on the campus. So it can be much more community accessible. What do you envision having inside the gym? Um, similar to, you know, youth basketball, for example, is, is usually popular in our community, something like that. I think we've also heard in our engagement there's a lack of space for birthday parties. Um, yeah. And so it could be things like that as well. So so anything really running the gamut from, I know our, our friends in the Boys and Girls Club run a great after school program, love to use that space. I know there's a need for, for youth basketball, weekend basketball. This would actually be closer, I believe, to a full size high school basketball court. So it could also be more about use as well as the, you know, or two courts sort of go a long way as well as the Wi Fi. Um, so we do envision that as, as community use. I think again, we have to think about how we work with our, our partners in the city around opening, closing, things like that on weekends. We're not staffed on weekends, but that is the intent of the location of this space to eventually work towards really activating the field of the gym. Um, I remember in the surveys that I looked through, the community surveys, there was a lot of interest in more gymnastics. Oh, that was something that came up over and over again. Pickleball and gymnastics was something that clearly came up. Yeah, and so wondering if there's, an, and as someone that desperately tried to get gymnastics for my kids, I can tell you that it was, it's besides this, at Burgess, there's not very much. We haven't heard that particular feedback, but I think the gym would certainly be well set up for that. I think it's a question of storage for mats and things like that, which yeah. I don't think is necessarily difficult as a, Parent of a three year old daughter who also enjoys gymnastics. I think that's it's a great idea. I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought about that for years. Yeah. All right. Are there any other comments from the commission? Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is a study session on preliminary staffing data for the Menlo Park Community Campus. Um, LCS Director Sean Reinhardt will make a presentation. Yes, thank you. I'm just going to get what PowerPoint set up here. So these slides were included in the uh, agenda packet. So I'll kind of try to briefly go through them. And really kind of get to the questions or discussion. There may be a uh, nice image of the Menlo Park Community Campus Outdoor Terrace. Mm -hmm. So, the overview here is city staff is recommending that the commission just receive and review this data related to the Menlo Park Community Campus staffing and operations. There's no recommendation or action requested at this time. However, comments, questions, and feedback are welcomed. Um, a little bit of background. In September of last year, City Council, as well as the Parks and Recreation Commission, reviewed community survey results related to um, the community's desired needs for recreation programs, in particular in the new facility. In January of this year, the City Council reviewed some preliminary estimates. Uh, approximately four to five full time staff at that point in time was the estimate would be needed to support the gymnasium, the recreation center, the other spaces in the new facility. In April, of this year, um, all supported with input from the Parks and Recreation Commission, the City Council reviewed proposed programming plan elements for the new facility. And then in June, the city's proposed operating budget included a request for six full time equivalent personnel to support the operations in the new facility. Then on June 13th, the City Council held a public hearing about the operating budget and discussed various strategies to reduce a significant projected budget deficit. Uh, the city council was provided a memorandum at that meeting outlining the necessary costs to operate the new campus and the additional services being provided there. The city council members requested some additional information and service level analysis um, around the potential for operating the new campus using existing staffing levels without the additional new staff that were requested. So city staff were to, to develop that data. It's in this presentation in the packet. Also was presented to city council for consideration last night during budget adoption 
the city council determined to um, uh, revisit that data in, in more depth at a future time, um, no later than September with this staff's recommendation. So a quick overview of the current services in the library and community services department. First of all, the staff is dedicated, hardworking, talented, public servants. Um, the department actually has fewer staff now than we had before the pandemic. Uh, Menlo Park residents desire and expect a very high quality and high level of service. Um, the staff is currently working at maximum capacity to meet our service demands, and the staff provide a diverse array of high quality services to the community, which you see over here. Many of these would be in the MPCC, not all, but you can see it spans the gamut from libraries, recreation, sports, childcare, um, senior programs, community events, and of course, public advice program. Let's see, that's the slide here. So a summary of the new service needs at the Menlo Park Community Campus that's on track to open during the upcoming fiscal year, probably the first part of the calendar year 2024. It's a large, complex, multi-service public facility. It's 37,000 square feet in size on two levels. It does incorporate some current programs that are currently operating, like the Senior Center, which is currently operating with this location. We'll move into the new facility. Uh, the Youth Center and Branch Library are currently operating in other locations. Those are planned to move into the new facility, but also expand somewhat. And then the new facility very significantly restores services that were there before that have not been there during construction. For example, the gymnasium, the fitness center, the library space will expand from one level to two levels. New maker space, new teen homework center. Additional staff capacity is needed to support those programs in the new facility. Um, also, new public facilities commonly experience significantly increased usage compared to the old facilities they replaced, typically two or three times higher usage, at least in the first few years. New building, people come out and, and start using it. Um, the former community center's closure, that was the Oneta Harris Community Center, that closure for construction actually coincided with the COVID-19 pandemic. And there were widespread facility closures at the same time because of the pandemic. And there were personnel reductions that were made necessary during the pandemic because of the economic downturn that occurred. And the staffing capacity has not recovered fully from that yet. So this chart um, shows the staffing levels for library and community services over the past um, five years, including what's projected or requested for the new fiscal year. As you can see, um, right before the pandemic, fiscal year ending 2020, Staffing levels were at 71 full-time equivalents. That's when the Lumetta Harris Center was operating and so forth. Um, you can see that, that downturn to 59 after the pandemic, when the pandemic was at its peak, and then kind of a slow restoration of some services as things started to open back up, including the gymnastics program last year. And so you can see what's proposed here, adding six full-time equivalent would basically get us uh, pretty much where we were staffing wise before the pandemic with a slight increase um, to account for some expanded services that are desired in the new facility. We've seen these images before, just to kind of show the floor plan of the new facility, the various uh, functions that are within it. It's very exciting. This is called a dollhouse view. It's the first floor. Going up to the second floor, you can see the various complex spaces. Again, 37,000 square feet. And so um, the new service needs really related to the new staffing that was um, requested really are about restoring services in the Bellhaven neighborhood that were suspended or reduced um, during the construction and the pandemic. The gymnasium, the fitness center, the recreation center, the facility rentals that were also very popular. Those are not currently there. The new building will kind of bring them back. Also the public library space will go from one floor to two. The current Bellhaven Branch Library is a single room, 3,500 square foot, small library. New facility has it on two levels, a little bit larger in floor space. These two service points. Um, new services that never existed before, a maker space and a team homework center uh, being key among them. Also, we uh, currently the senior center is only serving maybe about half as many daily lunches as it did before. And that's by virtue of being on the other side of town from where most of the participants live. We fully expect that to uh, return to the previous level, basically doubling from where it is now from around 40 or 50 lunches per day to over 100 per day. Um, in addition, um, we uh, have requested 
staff to support enhanced nutrition services to really evaluate the nutritional content of the meals that are being served to the senior center participants, as well as the youth center participants, ensure that the nutritional content of the food, in addition to being delicious and affordable, um, is, meets their, their health needs. Um, also opens up the possibility of a number of grants that are actually available for this type of nutrition program, but you have to be able to like quantify what is the nutritional value and content of the food that's being served. So that's why that request is there. And also a new building just has new operating costs, utilities, maintenance, and so forth. So the current overview of the department, these are kind of the major uh, work groups that are involved. Preschool is not part of the Menlo Park Community Campus. Um, neither is gymnastics. Those are in separate facilities. So we're really focusing on these four um, teams that are highlighted here. There's library, recreation, sports, and seniors. So you can see that 66.25 current full-time equivalent level. The six new proposed would result in 72.25 full-time equivalents. You can see in the red here how those would be distributed um, if those were um, approved. Um, this information was in the staff report, and so I won't break down on exactly the specific personnel, but happy to answer any questions about them. Uh, image of the front of the new facility. And just to quickly walk through the staffing analysis. So there are some major elements in the staffing analysis. The first is that we're really focusing on those four work groups. Okay, we're not talking about the child care. We're not talking about gymnastics. We're talking about library, recreation, sports, and seniors. There are two staffing types that we use. Those are the full-time equivalent staff who are, um, they, they receive benefits, they're kind of permanent employees, if you will. And then there's uh, temporary and seasonal help, on-call help. And then there's adjustment factors when calculating the number of staff that are needed um, for the whole employee, they're, they're human beings or people, they, they have leaves and vacations that they take, they take breaks and they by law. Um, there's vacancies that occur, they take time to refill, they have training and development needs. So you kind of have to adjust for those because those um, hours that they spend on those tasks, which are very important, um, aren't really focused on like just operating a building and keeping the doors open and answering questions uh, that people might have in running programs. So our current for those four divisions, library, recreation, sports, and seniors, not including the new Menlo Park community campus. Core services really revolve around staffing the customer service points, like the front desk here at the rec center. You can see there's an individual working there to help people when they come into the building uh, with a number of those. There's the opening and closing procedures for each of the facilities. Um, the senior meal program is a major program. It's a daily lunch service. Um, the library circulates books. Um, they have to add to and maintain that collection. And then the facility rentals are very popular. You need people to set up the rooms, to schedule the rooms, to be on site, especially evenings and weekends. We get a lot of evening weekend use. And then inside of those buildings as well, there are core programs, the recreation classes, the drop-in sports, the organized leagues. There's the grocery distribution that accompanies the senior meal program. Uh, the library offers early literacy programs like story times, cultural and literary, literary programs. Um, the senior center has socialized socializing events once a month uh, for the seniors keep them active in those community events. And then um, there are support tasks just associated with all that. You gotta pay the bills, you gotta supply the facility, uh, all those staff need to be scheduled and coordinated. Um, it needs to be outreach to the community so they know what's going on inside the facility and they have a way to give their input into the services in the facility. Um, there's various reports that are needed to be done for grants, for the commission, uh, for the city council. And then there's data entry and maintenance between our two major platforms, the library platform and the recreation platform. We basically have account data on, on I think, about 80% of Menlo Park residents, um, something like 25,000 individual accounts that we maintain, as well as all the library books and other information in there. So there's a lot of information in these slides. So I'm just going to kind of break down what we currently are using or working with for those four divisions. This is not including the Menlo Park Community Campus. This first chart is full-time equivalents. There are 27.5 full-time equivalent employees in those four units. 
uh, that equates to about 57,000 total annual hours. It's not adjusted. It's kind of easier to think about it in weekly hours. It's about 1,100 hours per week of, of staff availability. On this side is the temporary and seasonal help. These are our actual numbers for the current fiscal year. Current fiscal year is almost over. We've used about 25,000 hours of temp support for the year, which is about 483 per week. So you kind of see um, a pretty substantial part of our workforce with the temporary and seasonal folks. You couldn't do it without them. But then there's those adjustments that I've spoke about. So those are the, again, those numbers I'll go back, the 1100 per week for FTE and 483 per temp. Oh, those are the numbers to watch for this second chart here. Those numbers show up here. So now we're looking at FTE in this row, temp in this row. There's those total unadjusted hours. Those fo folks have leaves that they approve, vacation. They take breaks every two hours. It needs to be a paid 15 minute break. And then there's an unpaid meal break for <clears throat> a long shift. That's what people um, have. Um, uh, sometimes they're sick, and there's sick leave that people accrue. Um, there's also just a little bit of passing time as people are sort of changing the guard or to the restroom and to and from different locations. Um, it starts to add up. Then there's more extended other leaves that occur sometimes. Unfortunately, folks um, be, become, they need to go on workers' compensation, or they maybe have a life event that requires them to take, say, family medical leave. In some cases, there's bereavement leave. There's, there's other forms of leave. And so that really do, does actually account for um, these, these percentages. We're about, for a full-time equivalent, on average across the organization, about 25% of that raw total is really just about that whole employee and that they, that they have those leaves and breaks of passing time. For the temporary seasonal help, they accrue, they don't really accrue like vacation and other leave like that. So that number's less. And then you can see the adjusted column there. Uh, right now we're factoring in about a 10% vacancy factor. Um, it's been a bit of a struggle to recruit and retain personnel. We're still kind of adjusting to the new normal post pandemic. I also think the rising cost of living in the area it is a bit of a factor. Um, so right now we're running a little bit above this vacancy factor. <clears throat> in a good year, we normally would have a vacancy factor around 5%, but we're projecting 10% here for this analysis. And then there is that training and development. This 4% you know, really equates to like a little bit more than an hour a week of training and staff development and meetings, things like that. So you can see that adjusts that 1,500 total hours in the raw total, kind of adjusted more to about 1,088 currently using those four divisions. And how are those spent? You know, going back to those core services, those core programs, those support tasks. And we'll bore you with walking through every single one of these again, but happy to answer questions. So you can see the total amount of, of time that's really needed to perform those tasks. Again, this is not including the normal park community campus. That's this building, that's the gymnasium. The gymnastic, not the gymnastic center, the library, the senior center. Um, so then you just sort of kind of break it down to here were those adjusted staff hours available at 1088. Here's the total staff hours that are used for those core services at 1078. So you can see currently, you know, that delta we're running per week is about 10 hours, really within 1%. Obviously, there's a margin of error in, in this whole analysis, but basically what this shows is that we're pretty much at maximum capacity. Um, these other two columns just express in terms of hours per year or express this full-time equivalent in case that's easier to sort of get one's mind around. Uh, and then moving on, this is a shot of the back of the new building, uh, rendering the maker space rendering of one of the two library spaces, the children's library. Okay, just, and then just repeating the same analysis for the new capacity for the MPCC, right? So this would not include the current staff who are moving in, like the senior center staff that are moving in, not included in this part. The library functions that are moving in, not included here. What's gonna really be included here is the additional. The gymnasium that doesn't currently exist, being built, this would be the capacity for that. In some cases, like the senior center is currently only serving about half as many lunches. We expect that to double. So there's some added capacity there. 
Um, the library is going from one floor to two. So we're not talking about that first floor, we're really talking about that added capacity of that second floor in this part of the analysis. So this is just what's kind of above what we're currently offering. See it's a smaller set of services. Um, those support tasks are pretty static because a new building is a new building and it still has you know, kind of overhead. Okay, same analysis here. It'll be a little faster because we've already gone through the previous one. Six FTE. You see what that weekly hours is. Uh, our proposal was for about 57, 90, and annual temp hours are about 111 hours per week. So you can just see those numbers there. Um, same uh, kind of adjustments, except we're projecting a vacancy factor of zero instead of 10% for the MPCC because we new facility, we would not want to leave any positions vacant, at least in the first year or two. We want to make sure that it's fully staffed at all times. If a vacancy occurred, we will move immediately to backfill it or um, give someone a provisional assignment or something and not maintain the vacancy factor there. So you can see that adjusts the 351 hours per week down to 269. And again, here's that breakdown. Again, these this is the new capacity for MPCC. There will be additional service points like the second floor in the library, a new service point for a gym that doesn't currently exist, and, and so on down the list. Um, and so that sort of leads to this chart. We're almost done here. Um, so the proposed for Menlo Park Community Campus staff hours per week, that adjusted number 269. Here's kind of what's proposed to spend it. About 285 being spent in this analysis, actually coming up short about 16 hours a week in this particular um, analysis here for the six full time equivalent plus the temps. That's a delta of about 6%. Now that's 6% of a smaller number. Um, so, uh, but you can see it's, again, it's pretty much like right in the ballpark there for how much staff is needed to produce, provide the services that are shown here. So our preliminary indicators from all this is that the largest uses of that new and restored capacity at the Menlo Park Community Campus, they're really related to core services and open hours. The customer service points that allow the doors to be open, people to come in, um, the new and restored core programs at the fitness center, like the gymnasium, like the second floor library space. Um, those are the largest uses. It's really about keeping the building open and like, the main programs. Um, the those teams, library, recreation, sports, and seniors, they're currently operating at the maximum staffing capacity to meet the current demands. So proposed new capacity is needed to provide new and expanded programs at the new facility. And as all the charts have kind of shown. Um, so this last slide is really just kind of that comparison of the two, kind of taking the two analyses and just sort of putting them together on one summary chart. So again, this is the total staff hours available, total staff hours needed, and then the delta. So this first column here, or second column, I guess, is the current hours per week without the MPC C. This next column proposed new is that additional capacity. And then this would be the total. So you can see the delta there is around six hours per week out of 1300, less than 1%. So really the, that's kind of where the six full time like the one request comes from. And it really is pretty much exactly what is projected to be in these service needs. And that is the presentation. And thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions there might be. Thank you, Dr. Feinhardt. Um, Ashley, do we have any public comments? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please notify the staff liaison by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your table screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. And we do have a public comment. Pam Jones? Yes, good evening again. Um, I have three questions, comments, and uh, I'll start with um, the kitchen. I didn't hear anything about how the uh, current staff is going to be educated and trained on using the new kitchen since it's all electric and substantially different than what they've been using. Um, 
The other thing is with the nutrition program, which I am thrilled about because when there was boxed um, food, food that came from outside uh, what was cooked, um, it always had a high salt content. And the last thing you want for our seniors is to have a high uh, salt content. They shouldn't have any salt, um, but it's hard to get used to that. The In regards to the person that is going to be the enhanced um, uh, nutrition services, uh, is there um, a way to, to have upward mobility for current staff so that they are, get the proper training to be able to do that work? Because um, you do have a number of people that have worked for um, probably decades, you know, for the center, and it would be wonderful if we could elevate um, them. Um, let's see here. And, okay, um, when I think about the staffing, and yes, it has to be staffed appropriately, but I also was thinking about how in the future, um, we're going to be short of money that we will not have the revenue coming in like we have had in the past. What that's going to do to us, I don't know. I suspect one of the things that will happen is the fees for services will be increased um, for everybody, for outside people, you know, non-residents and residents. And that may make it prohibited for some community members to attend. So I'm wondering if we can actually begin to take that part into consideration because it would be very sad that if we had to lay off people after we had all of these programs. And I'm certain that there's a way that we can um, prevent that happening. Um, I do look forward to the center being open. I drive by every time I get an opportunity and I drive through the double gate if it's not closed yet. And they kind of look at me like, what am I doing there? And, um, but I do it anyway. Anyway, I um, uh, th thank you for the report and I am looking for the center being open. Thank you. And if there's no other public comments, yes, one in the back. Hello, everybody. So my name is Elise Stein, and I am on the Library Board Foundation, but I'm here as a Menlo Park resident. That wonderful new facility, we really must fully staff it. I'm here to support the proposal. I thought the presentation was exquisite in its detail and explanation of the FTE's current staff and future staff. Without the staff, that building is just an empty shell. And we've been behind the eight ball in providing the services to the community here for so many years. We really cannot step backwards at this point. If not now, when? So I'm just making the point that we, as a community, really need to commit to the center. And it, you can't run the center without staff. If there's no other public comments, I'll turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, discussion is open for the commission. Excellent presentation. And um, I, I guess my question is around the staff. Like I, I echo your thoughts, like a building is just an empty space without people that know it and can work in it. Um, I'm curious to know how challenging it will be to find staff. Um, I, I asked this because I've met with a number of different organizations, not ones that you've included here. So I'm just curious because these are different ones, but um, I've sat in with um, the Menlo Park City Police, um, and they've had a hard time staffing. Um, speaking with um, Karen and Gymnastics, they've struggled with staffing. And then even speaking to some of our um, sports vendors, they seem to have a challenge staffing as well. So I'm just curious, has that, do you anticipate, even though, you know, we need to hire six or seven individuals, are we going to be able to find those individuals that will be able to commute here or or live here and work for the type of salary that we're offering? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think it actually gives me an opportunity to address uh, one of the public comments, uh, at least partially. So we're very focused on developing uh, our current talent to you know advance toward whatever their career goals may be. And so um, you know, we're always very focused on our internal candidates, helping them to kind of achieve that goal. And when we have opportunities you know, that open up, uh, we, many, many times we found that folks have you know, gotten promotions or in particular gone from that temporary seasonal help status to that like benefited full-time mm -hmm. equivalent status. And so, um, so we're very focused on training our staff to you know adapt to kind of new tools, for example, new kitchen equipment. And we're very focused on encouraging and supporting like a, a particular or temporary staff to be competitive for um, like the permanent positions so that they can advance into that. And we've been very fortunate that we've had many folks who started with our organization in these kind of temporary seasonal roles. And then they do actually uh, move on and, and get promoted into these like permanent roles. And I think for like, for example, like the, the kitchen team and uh, like the nutritional services coordinator, I think where we would, we would kind of have a built-in pool of really great candidates who we think would be very competitive for like that position. And uh, we'd certainly be looking at our internal folks first. As far as like recruitment and retention, just in general, um, it sort of depends on the position. Uh, we've been very successful in, in some uh, positions, uh, in particular, the benefited ones, those seem to draw a lot more um, like response. With the temp positions, it's a little hit or miss, just and it really kind of boils down to, I think in most cases, the compensation, mm -hmm. the hourly compensation, and how does it compare to, say, retailers or, or food service? And that's where we struggle a little bit on like some of the really kind of um, the, the lowest paid of the temporary personnel, because in addition to the hourly rate, which like say if it's $18, $19 an hour, which maybe is, is great for a, a high school student um, uh, who just wants extra money for the summer. It's not really something that's gonna be sustainable for someone who's like trying to earn, earn a living. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, when you see like other, like say retailers paying several dollars more than that. And on top of that, they can provide more hours because our, our temporary personnel were limited to the number of hours per year we use them. So there's all those factors kind of involved, but again, we've it's, it's kind of depends on the position. And so um, it, it's kind of case by case basis. But if I'm understanding you, the idea would be we could, we have a natural funnel of some temporary workers that we could identify for these full-time roles and, you know, have that process work and they're, you know, it, it wouldn't be that we have these job wrecks out and there we're not able to fill them. There is some sort of funnel of people that you expect would like to have those roles. And then we'd be more backfilling for the temp roles. Yeah, really. So, so the, the permanent full-time roles, yes, our focus would definitely be on the staff who are already here because they know the organization, they have experience with us, we've been training them to make that transition. Um, and also those roles tend to be just more attractive because mm -hmm. they, they do receive benefits, they're full time in most cases, where we have a little more difficulty on the recruitment and retention side is in the temporary and seasonal help because the benefits are, are very, very limited. Gotcha. There's only a limited number of hours and the, just the overall compensation is less. Gotcha. Okay. I, I will echo the um, impressiveness of that presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I'm curious, have you been able to harness volunteers in the community at all? We've been very fortunate to have volunteers help us in a number of ways. The pandemic kind of set us back a little bit on that. Um, our volunteer programs, some of them sort of dispersed and have yet to return. A, a key one is like the homework support center. Prior to the pandemic, we had a number of really dedicated, really skilled volunteers who are helping tutor students one-to-one -one in small groups after school. It was a very robust program. Pandemic really kind of put the wet blanket on that. And then of course, um, you know, now we're building a new center with a new homework center. So we're looking to volunteers probably to help with that program. Also the senior meal program that does benefit from some volunteer support. 
Um, uh, I think where we get the most volunteer support is really more in the fundraising capacity. So, for example, the Friends of Menlo Park Library, they do pretty substantial fundraising through taking donations of books and selling them and then using the proceeds for library programs. And, and the Menlo Park Library Foundation, we have one of our commenters tonight, they do the same more for like capital one time projects. Those are all volunteer. Um, so, for the new facility, we definitely are planning to use volunteers. Um, however, there's, there's sort of a, a limit to how much you can kind of uh, put on volunteers, um, you know, to like operate up, you know, a complex program. So yeah. we make uh, the most use of them as we can, but, you know, there, there's a little bit of a ceiling as far as what you can kind of give to them. And I might add that we have some of the same issues with volunteers that we would have with temporary staff, which is recruiting and retaining yeah. and can't require volunteers to show up for shifts necessarily so there's there are limitations to using volunteers though, though they're very important to the administrative overhead that's a lot so i'm curious did you get um feedback from the council yesterday about this or i'm curious what the next steps are related to to this yeah, you know, I, I'm just, I'm really so appreciative of our city council because they really approach every issue, including the budget, with the community's best interests in mind. You know, the city is facing some pretty significant budget deficits, and I won't go into all the reasons why they're outlined to some extent on the staff report. And so they're really looking at how do we make the right decision for the short term and the long term for our community. So some of their feedback really was we need to take a deeper dive into this. And so let's bring this back so we can have that more robust conversation about it. Also, two of the city council members weren't present last night, just that by happenstance, and they really didn't want to tackle something like this in depth without those council members there. In particular, um, the vice mayor was not able to be president of the, this facility in her district. And some of the feedback uh, from city council members were, we definitely want to take a closer look at this. Totally understand that there's a lot of um, uh, need and a desire on the part of the community for this center to fulfill our, our vision for it. Um, but it does come down to, you know, what's in the best interest of the community in this moment where there's this budget deficit, how do we resolve that? And, and this is only one of several different things that they're, they're kind of looking at in discussion. I will uh, add to everyone else's comment that that was a superb presentation. Um, the way that um, the data is presented is crystal clear. Um, and I think one piece of information in particular um, that um, that helps your storytelling effort there is that um, jobs did go away during the pandemic. So this isn't an increase year over year in staffing. Um, part of this is to bring it back up and to account for new services and facilities. Well, thank you. It's been quite quite a journey since 2020 for the library and community services department. Great team. Are there any other comments? Yeah, this is a little anecdotal, so forgive me, but um, I've been attending the Bellhaven Library story time hour with my, my young one, and attendance there has been pretty low. Um, I think there's an assumption here that with the new facility, you expect like two, three times higher usage, I guess, based off of the former Omega Harris um, uh, attendance, right? So uh, I was wondering, maybe we could do a better job with outreach, perhaps, in terms of maybe a bilingual offer. I mean, I don't know if that's already factored into, you know, outreach to the members of the local community saying, hey, first of all, the facility is open, it's available for you guys to use. And then um, just, it, again, I, I'm, I'm personally, I'm so looking forward for it to be open and to uh, create a vibrant space for everyone to use, so yeah. yeah thank you for that. So um, the estimate of like the increased usage really is drawn from like other communities that have built new libraries, new community centers. It's very, very typical that you see that doubling, tripling of usage, at least in the first year or two. 
Um, so we're, we're like fully anticipating that. The Bellhaven Branch Library, um, I think one of the reasons why it was included in this project is that it never really did what I think was envisioned when it was first built, I think in 1999. It still really feels like and kind of functions like a school library. And um, it never really has gotten, to my knowledge, you know, the level of use that it uh, probably could and, and will have with its own kind of religious kind of dedicated like, public library facility. And what's more, having that at the same location as the swimming pool, the gymnasium, the rec center, and, and the event hall, there'll be a, just a lot more convenient and a lot more synergy for residents who are using it. One of the comments I hear, and Nick, feel free to jump in, is you know, from folks feel like the 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 Bell Haven Library doesn't quite meet the needs, especially of like adult visitors. And so just by not having that kind of regular contact with it, sort of usage just overall just, just kind of slumps. I don't know if I've kind of captured it. But. Yeah, I think that's fair. And that's something that the community said to us when we were doing um, some studies and, and a lot of outreach in 2018 when we were talking about building a standalone branch library, a new standalone branch library in the neighborhood. There were a lot of, of comments from the community that the, the library, oh, I thought that was just the school's library. Oh, there's not really a lot for my teens to do there oh i just go there and sometimes pick up holes but if i want to like browse for things there's not enough of a collection there for me as an adult so it's something we've been trying to to increase attendance at the branch library the current branch library for a long time and, and not really being successful with that and i think it's a combination of factors there and very quickly about the uh tutoring or mentorship program you yeah. Pre-pandemic mentioned that was very robust. I, I personally would love to kind of see that somehow uh, uh, replicated in this new facility. And if there's anything commission could do to help accelerate that, um, I'd, I'd be all for it. I think it's so great to have, you know mentors and, and mentees come together and help each other grow. So fantastic. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> we can come back with some more information about that when we resume uh, the discussion about the MPCC programming, which we were going to be talking about at this month's meeting, but um, this this seems to be a little more timely and appropriate for this month. So we can dive into that a little bit more in future meetings. Um, I'm curious with the initial donation for the center, was the donation only earmarked for the building of the facility and then Menlo Park committed to the ongoing maintenance? Is that how it worked? Yes. So um, Facebook now Meta came forward and said, we will construct the facility. We will basically cover building it, um, most of it. There were some elements that really they said, well, this city, if you want to add those on, then you pay for those things. So like the pool and stuff like that. Uh, but not the ongoing obligations. So and there was no, and there was no contractual obligations in that of how much staffing or, or programs that you sort of were required as part of this gift. No, not like explicit like that because the agreement with Face Meta it really is about the constructing the facility. Mm -hmm. But there are some sort of indirect um, sort of. Um, criteria around that. So for example, the idea here was to um, replace and somewhat upgrade um, the facilities that were previously there, right? So there previously was a senior center, a gymnasium, a youth center, a pool, and there's currently the branch library. So it's really replacing those facilities with like facilities, obviously newer, a little bit expanded. Um, and so the implication there, the indirect is that, well, obviously, you know, these are the programs that are going to be in there because what's being built yeah. is a pool and a library and a new so forth. Um, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
All right, if there aren't any other comments, we can move on to regular business. Um, under regular business, the Parks and Recreation Commission considers recommendations from city staff on policy matters and administrative actions that require Parks and Recre Recreation Commission approval. Uh, the first regular business is item F1, approved minutes from the May 24th Parks and Recreation meeting. Ashley, do we have any public comment on this item? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment, please notify the staff by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can engage the star nine feature to raise a hand. Open for a Parks and Recreation Commission discussion. Just a, a question. Um, it was not at that meeting. I, I don't know if by Robert's rules, I can or cannot vote, but then also would there not be a quorum to approve that if I abstain? You, you can vote to approve the minutes if you were not present. Obviously that's the commission's choice, but there's no rule against it. Mm -hmm. And then as far as approval goes, you just need a majority of the members present oh, so it to approve. Okay. So, so if you feel abstaining. like abstaining, it's going to be okay. Hopefully. Oh, no, no, no. You need to have a majority of the commission. Oh, I'm sorry. So you would need four okay. votes to apologize. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pull this back on that. Okay. I'll trust our note taking. <laughs> um, okay. Would a commissioner like to motion for approval of the minutes? I'll move to approve the minutes. And uh, do we have a second? Second. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor for the minutes from the May 24th Parks and Rec Commission meeting to be approved. Commissioner Baskin, can you vote? Yes. Commissioner, oh, I'm sorry. Chair Browson? Vice Chair. Vice Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, and Commissioner Gil Martin? Yes. Commissioner Lee? Yes. And the motion passes. Minutes are approved. Okay, next item is informational items. Uh, informational items are transmitted to the Parks and Recreation Commission in staff's effort to provide an update on matters of importance to the commission. Informational items are not action items. However, a commissioner, city staff member, or a public member may request to comment or ask a question of any informational items. The first informational item, um, Library and uh, Library Commission Services Assistant Director Nick Schenkta will provide a brief introduction to this item. Ashley, do we have any public comment? At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please notify the staff liaison by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. And again, this is the call for public comment on the department updates. And then this time it looks like there's no public comment. I might have done that before. It's yeah. okay. okay. <laughs> I was just going to give a very brief introduction to it. You, the, the department updates are there um, in the packet. Uh, just to highlight a couple of things, you heard a lot about the, the budget and the budget hearings already. Um, the library summer reading game is going on right now. Um, a lot of activities for kids, including a uh, puppet festival, which I was like, that's not going to be popular, but we had like 120 people at our first puppet show, so the puppets are still really popular. Um, for the Parks and Rec Commission, uh, there's a lot of uh, events going on this summer. We're bringing back the lot, sort of larger community-wide events. Uh, we had a Juneteenth celebration at Carly Park Park. It was great. Thumbs up on the tacos. Uh, the 4th of July parade and celebration is coming up. So there will be a parade downtown, down Santa Cruz, and then kind of a festival and a band and some food at Fremont Park. And the summer concert series kicks off, I believe, July 11th and is weekly. Um, I think there's six concerts for it Fremont Park and two at Carly Car Park. Park. Uh, something to highlight um, annually, we do close the athletic fields in order to 
uh, rehab and condition them so that they're uh, in good order throughout the rest of the year. So uh, there's a schedule there um, in the packet about the athletic field closures, uh, just in case you get any questions about that from the members, um, members of the community, because that is something that comes up every year. And then uh, we started putting some statistics in uh, to the packets. Um, so take a look at those and see um, those look good. If you have questions about them, if you think we should be reporting back uh, certain sort of other things to the commission or if there are other things you'd like to know about, uh, let us know and we can try to include them in upcoming uh, reports. The idea is to have these uh, monthly, um, quarterly at the very least, but we'd like to try to have them monthly so that you can sort of see uh, what's going on. And some feedback we got from the library commission is that it would be useful to have kind of year over year statistics so they had something to compare them to and maybe even have them um, a year pre-COVID and now so that they could see how things were maybe recovering or not recovering in certain areas. That one, I'll turn it back over to the vice chair. If you have any questions or comments, happy to, to feed those. I maybe we should ask for public comment again now that you have mm -hmm. given your report. That's fair <laughs> At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please notify the staff liaison by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use the star nine feature to engage the raise hand function. No public comment. No public comment. Okay. Um, I'll say the July 4th grade was always pretty amazing. Like, I'm pretty younger. I'm really glad to be back. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. I, I, in previous years, I've dressed as Uncle Sam and walked oh. in the parade, but I don't have the facial hair for it this year. So I don't think I'm going to do Uncle Sam. I sort of have a reverse Uncle Sam going on <laughs> right now. But I'll be there. And, I, and a lot of, I know a lot of staff are really looking forward to that. It's a lot of fun. Okay, if there's no other comment from the commission, um, Assistant Director Nick Shankton will provide a brief introduction to the tentative agenda calendar. Let's see if I can get this up on the screen for you guys. Pardon me. Switched away from it on my screen just as I started talking about it. Okay, here we go. All right, a couple of things to highlight here. Um, this is a uh, top for our new commissioners. We have this agenda planning calendar just to kind of keep ourselves on track. Um, we have uh, coming up looking at a draft, the parks and recreation facility master plan addendum, um, that discussion about programming and policies that Sean was mentioning earlier. Um, our suggestion box, it's always nice to hear from the community and what they're talking to us about. And then uh, there's an annual commission work plan. And so we're going to bring that back to the commission next month. Um, the work plan is supposed to be presented to the council by September. So we wanted to give you a little time to look at it. Um, we try to align commission work plans with uh, city council priorities and um, departmental um, planning as well. Let's move around sometimes, but if there's anything the commission wants to add, change, maybe put in a parking lot somewhere, just let us know. <laughs> We've talked a couple of times about potentially reopening the master plan for Burgess. And I know your plate is running over with the MPCC, but I'm curious how you think about that um, relative to, you know, in, in the priority list and how that could potentially start. Well, I think the idea is um, the Parks and Rec master plan is about five years old now. Am I correct? I'm looking at Tricia. 2019. 2019. Okay, four years old, going on five years old. Um, 
the idea was the community has changed some of the projects in the parks and rec facilities master plan are underway and some of them are in the queue in like the um, capital improvement projects so they're bigger things like park rehabs and and uh, the the willow oaks park we have which i think is ended up in front of council in july or in august um but the idea was to sort of uh take a look at it see if there are things that weren't considered like pickleball for instance um in the earlier rounds of community engagement uh, see if we wanted to try to start to build a queue for things for the, for the parks and rec so the best plan. i don't know if i answered your question or not but that was that was staff's idea was to sort of take a look at some of the issues that have been coming up over the past four years and see if we could start to put them into the parks and rec facilities master plan. So that is contemplated this year. Or so actually on the tentative calendar to, to start next month, we would have gotten started this month, but the CC staffing kind of took precedent. So as you can see, oh, the screen now, right. but Sorry. Um, Looking to work on the the addendum over the next three months, mm -hmm. so July, August, and September, and and to next point, I think part of it, I think the, the main thrust of this particular go around is is pickleball. Yeah. I think it's been a, a pilot program in place for a few years, but uh, we also are, and we could talk about it more next month. But looking at okay, well then, what is that? Reg, what is that kind of a regular review cadence for incorporating? Other things that have come up and, and kind of plugging them into the plan so that we're carrying out projects and programs in a coordinated fashion that's like per the plan. So um, you know we're we're also going to be looking at incorporating that element and kind of a regular um, process. So four years don't go by without touching the plan. They can at least every two years, maybe an annual mm -hmm. touch base, so that we can make sure that. New things that come into the queue can actually get into the queue and then move through the queue, uh, just like the rest of the stuff that's already in there. Would you imagine as part of this that you would be doing outreach to the community to get their ideas and to have them come and give their feedback? Or is that just for over that be later? You know, this go around, um, I think because of the, the, the capacity issues and the main focus right now is on the NPCC mm -hmm. and the really the impetus for this addendum is pickleball. Yeah. So I think we're trying to keep the focus really narrow on pickleball for this go round. And then I think, so we've gotten a lot of community input about pickleball yeah. and surveys and everything. Then like this, the kind of the next go around though, I think definitely a more robust like community input. Let's hear what people, um you know have to say or suggestions about it and we have a little more capacity to actually do something with what we hear yeah so it sounds like the the feeling is that the, the pickleball should happen just given the community interest and the question is how do we add that to the master plan yes i, I would even go a little further and say pickleball has happened <laughs> you know it's kind of already happening and so before and there's a desire among a, a pretty significant contingent of the community to do more. And so before we go further, we were kind of like, you know, we really need to be coordinated about this in, in the plan. So so that's kind of where we are with, with pickleball. That pilot, I think, started in one stage uh, early 2021, it was during it was a pandemic pilot mm -hmm. program. But the last time, to your point, the last time we went out and sort of asked the community about parks and recreation topics was in the summer of last year in 2022 because we came back the results of that to the commission here in September of 2022 so we you know I'm thinking certainly you know later than after we opened the new facility with or a month or two after we opened the new facility we might want to go out and ask the community about how it's going and what they want to see. Yeah, I do want to draw a distinction between like programs and facilities, right? So the survey we did last year was really more about like the programs inside, but the parks and rec facilities master plan is really about the actual parklands themselves, the physical tennis courts, the physical buildings. Um, so the, there are those two elements. And 
with the, the programs, there's, there's one whole set of considerations starting a new program or, or ending one or changing it. It's actually a little simpler than like capital projects where it's like constructing new pickleball courts or constructing a new multi-service facility. Those typically are considered in terms of like years because they have to plug into really an overall scheme of the city's infrastructure and buildings. And it costs a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we go on to any more conversation, um, if there aren't any other comments, um, we should go to Ashley for public comment. Yes, thank you. At this time, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please notify the staff by using the raise hand feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're dialing in, you can use star nine to engage the raise hand function. We do not have any Okay, all right, thank you. Is there any more public or a uh, comment from the commission? Okay. Um, the next item is uh, around commissioner reports. Would any commissioner like to make a short report out on items of interest to the entire commission? I have one planning, but I'm not ready for tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, Meeting is adjourned at 8.10 p.m. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Very much. First up for the talk.